No one executes more of its citizens than we do right here in Harris County. Consider, too, that Texas leads the nation in wrongful convictions. We now know that we have convicted at least 150 innocent citizens and killed at least two. Consider that Harris County leads the nation in wrongful convictions and ask yourself whether or not we should continue to seek death here in Harris County in the state of Texas, and whether or not we should hold prosecutors accountable in wrongful conviction cases, and whether we can afford either. Good evening and welcome to HGCLA's Reasonable Doubt. My name's Carmen Rowe and I'm the president of HGCLA, the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. We're the largest local criminal defense bar in the country. And tonight we're gonna talk about death penalty right here in Harris County, in the state of Texas and across the country with our special guest, Catherine Case, who's the executive director of the Texas Defender Services right here in downtown Houston. She's going to discuss this and much more with our host, Jimmy Ardwan and Damon Parrish. Thank you, Carmen. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. I'm Jimmy Ardwan, along with my co-host, Damon Parrish. Tonight, as Carmen said, we welcome to the program Catherine Case of the Texas Defender Service. And we're going to talk about the death penalty, its use across the country, <laughs> and its use, its extended use in Harris County. <laughs> Got me all cracked up there, Dave. I apologize Good. for that. That's all right. That's all right. You got to wait your turn to be brought in here. I'm so excited to be on TV. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna be uh, taking your questions live on the air. If you'll send us your tweets at hccla underscore tv, you can also call in the show starting at 8:30. We'll put the phone lines up on the TV, and you can call us at your convenience, and we'll take your questions right here on the air, both for us and for Catherine. Uh, as the night moves on. I uh, want to bring in my co-host Damon Parrish right now. Damon, good evening. How are you? All right. You so got funny. a little eager there coming on I camera. I was excited. You know, I love being on TV. Dude. I know you do. I love it. I know you do. Um, and I, uh, Damon, I want to bring in, before we get to you on the current events, because right, I know right. you've got a lot to talk about tonight. Well, we have a big case. So uh, I, want, I want to bring in our guest, Catherine Case. Catherine, good evening. How are you? Great. We appreciate you coming on the show tonight, and uh, as, as I said, we're going to talk a little bit about current events before we delve into the death penalty here. And one of the first things I want to get started with tonight is, of course, the Baltimore riots. Of course. Uh, Damon, tell us a little bit about what's been happening in Baltimore early on this week. Well, Jimmy, it's a story that has repeated time and time again, at least for the past year, two years. We have uh, Ferguson, New York, California, South Carolina, and now we have Baltimore. We have uh, Freddie Gray, African-American man, taken into police custody. Uh, and somehow, between the time of arrest and getting to the station, he spinal injury, now he's dead. Uh, people say that he was, he was injured by the police during the arrest. The official report came out today, and they said he was injured in the van somehow by himself. Yeah, I saw that. Now, right. there was something that said there was a, the, a bolt that may have matched some injury that, that got into his head. What? That, you know, that, that just broke, I think, before I headed up here to the studio, so at least to me. I you just know? saw it right now, Jimmy. You know, I play football, you play football. I think we're both tough men. We're from, we're from Texas. It's hard to injure yourself handcuffed to the point where you're breaking your own spine, I, I would think. Uh, I used to do MMA training, jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, and I'm telling you, you can hurt yourself in a lot of ways, but I don't know if I can break my own spine. I think I might need help for that one. But uh, this story is repeating itself over and over again, and, of course, people in Baltimore already oppressed from years of oppression and, uh, and the over-militarization of, of the police force that we talked about before have now begun to riot and, and self-destruct in, in a, a way to get attention. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. Catherine, I want to get your thoughts on this as well, because we were talking before we came on air about your experience the other night come, had just heading home where I guess there was some, some protesters here in Houston that you encountered. Well, Texas Defender Service is located in the Third Ward. Right. And so as I was leaving last night, I noticed that there was a police vehicle stationed at the end of Blodgett by 
with 288 in front of it. And the, the car got there about six and it had its lights on. And I thought, what's going on here? Because I couldn't see any disturbance on the street. Then when I got on 288 to go towards 610, I noticed that there were police cars at every intersection all the way up 610 and that there were three via police vehicles in the median at 288 and Holly Hall. And um, I thought, this is really odd, this police presence. Um, what's it doing here? And then I realized that there had been a protest or a even not even really a protest. It was a bunch of concerned citizens that had come out in the third ward to say how disturbed they were about what happened in Baltimore and to say that, you know, Houston police need to be accountable accountable for racial injustice in, in Houston, which, of course, right. is an enormous issue and it's important. And, you know, I don't live in the third ward. I live in a neighborhood that is much more white, and I just find it really hard to believe that if I and my neighbors got together to talk about an issue of public concern, that the Houston Police Department would be out on every corner with their police vehicles guarding against a potential riot. I mean, right. I, I just am very discomfited by the suggestion that that presence implies that African Americans, when they get together to talk about issues of public concern, might riot in Houston. Right. And one of the questions that was posed that I saw earlier was, could a scenario like Baltimore uh, or Ferguson, could that happen in Houston? I, I just want to get your opinion on it, because you've, you've been here a while, you've, you've seen it as we all have, we've lived in this city a while. I mean, I'm not really sure that, I don't think we really know what, what could happen, because we haven't had something, um, to, in my opinion, here recently. Uh, that has caused kind of the furor where we see it ignite in social media as it has in the other cities. But do you think it could happen here? I mean, I would think that in Houston there is much more effort on the part of the leadership in the community, which is also much more racially mixed than Baltimore is, um, to really talk about criminal justice issues. You know, uh, there was a businessman, Gerald Smith, this past summer who um, wrote an opinion piece in the Chronicle saying, look, the business community and the Greater Houston Partnership and the local foundations need to get together to talk about criminal justice because non-white children in this community are treated mm -hmm. so differently within the system. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so there has been an effort to start that discussion, and then you have people like the Reverend Bill Lawson, um, Ar Archbishop Fiorenza, Rabbi Karf, who have been coming together with um, Bishop Dixon to talk about these issues. So I think that the odds of a riot are actually low here, and, and, and I really think that if you want to have, uh, if you want to guard against a riot, we all have to talk to each other, and we have to listen. And, um, you know, you don't go in expecting that things are going to get out of hand if you treat people right. with humanity right, and with sure. understanding. And I, and I think it's incumbent on those um, who are in charge in Houston to assume that those who want to talk, by and large, are people of goodwill. And, and so, you know, um, and, and it just concerns me when I see the show of force that suggests that people are not individuals of goodwill. Yeah. And Jimmy, I, I'm actually going to take <clears throat> a different side on that. I think it absolutely can happen in Houston. I think any place where you have a people, a large enough people who believe that they are being oppressed systematically by the government, and then you add to that, like Catherine said, a show of force within their own neighborhood, within their own backyard, when they're trying to assemble peacefully, which is guaranteed in the Constitution, and you're just going to voice a concern, and then immediately, and everywhere you turn, you're met with a, a military-like uh, invasion or show of force in your neighborhood, in your own home, I think that just adds fire to fire, and it makes people want to explode. Well, let me throw, saying that, let me throw this question out for both of you to answer, because some have said, and some on the other side will say, the, the police and the pro-law enforcement side will say, Look, these riots happen. That's the very reason that we need to have strong police presence is because these people can't control themselves <laughs> and they can't stop themselves. All they're going to do is come out and, and destroy their community and this is exactly why we need the police presence we have. What's, what's your response to that? You know, when Timothy McVeigh bombed the federal building in Oklahoma, did the Houston Police Department place the white people in Houston on lockdown? Right. I mean... <laughs> I think here, 
the, the question is, does skin color predict conduct? Right. And the answer, I would hope, on the part of thinking people is no. Or does skin color justify a certain response? Which you know, same same issue. If it was after after Kentucky played basketball and they lost in the fourth seed, which destroyed everybody's bracket. Exactly. I mean, man, th those kids flipped over cars and went <laughs> crazy, and it, it was just rowdy kids. It was just a rowdy time. It was a drunken furor. Uh, in response to uh, Ferguson, in response to Baltimore, well, those looters and animals, uh, you know, they, they deserve to be arrested. It's. It's, it's hard for people who've been oppressed or believe they've been oppressed to see a situation play out where there is a clear wrong and then on the media you're victimized and you're, you know, you're called an animal. Right. You're, you're told if you don't break the law then the police won't bother you, which as a defense attorney, we all know not to be true. Um, and so it's, I, can, I believe it can happen here. I don't believe it will happen in Houston. I, I'm with you, Catherine, on that completely, but I believe it can. Well, let's sure hope it, it doesn't. And you know, obviously, we hope that stuff like this doesn't happen again, but as we've seen, it keeps happening over and over again, unfortunately. The next item I want to move to, and this will kind of help us segue into, into our discussion for the night, is some breaking news happened earlier this week with regard to Robert Pruitt. Uh, he was a, he's a man on, on death row for fatally stabbing a prison guard back in 99, uh, and he was granted a stay of execution Tuesday night, just hours before. Uh, he was set to die. Uh, Catherine, what can you tell us about that case? Well, we've had six executions this year so far, but we've also had six stays of execution. And four of those stays have come from the Court of Criminal Appeals. And what's interesting about this latest stay for Robert Pruitt is it was signed by Burt Richardson in his role as a state district judge over Mr. Pruitt's case. But Mr. Richard, but Judge Richardson actually sits on the Court of Criminal Appeals. So here you have this, this Court of Criminal Appeals judge acting in a role as a district judge staying the execution. So this was a stay so that further DNA testing could occur. Prior DNA testing in the case, and this case involves the stabbing of a prison guard, um, is to determine if Mr. Pruitt's epithelial cells are on the tape-wrapped handle of um, the weapon that was used to stab the guard. Because as I understand it, the first time they ran the test, only the victim's blood or DNA was found on the weapon. Is that right? Right. And Mr. Pru and the victim's blood was not found on Mr. Mr. Pruitt. Pruitt. And as homicide lawyers know, um, when you're when a, an individual is stabbing someone else to death, that is an intimate act, right. and it is usual that there's um, cross-contamination of DNA in that cir circumstance. So the fact that there wasn't mm -hmm. the victim's DNA found on Mr. Pruitt seems very odd. And the thought is that this, um, you know, that, that much more sensitive DNA testing that we have available today is likely to find if Mr. Pruitt's epithelial cells from his hand or the hand of the murderer are present on that tape-wrapped handle. So we'll have to see um, what happens. And how long of a process does that normally take? So we've got the order signed on Tuesday. What are the next steps that we're looking at in Pruitt's case? It's usually what happens here is that um, there's going to be some sort of discussion with uh, the local prosecutor about who's going to do the testing. Is there going to be a defense expert present? Um, could they agree on a lab? Or is there going to be an effort to, um, when you extract the epithelial cells, to keep a portion of the extracted uh, sample there for the defense to come in and test? Mm -hmm. So there's probably some negotiation that's ongoing even at this point. And then once the negotiation is completed, there's going to be an arrangement to transport that weapon to a lab so that testing can occur. And then it really is dependent on the lab's caseload. Right. and how quickly they can get things done. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what we do know is that because Mr. Pruitt has had a pri has had, you know, this prior testing, it's really hoped that this testing is dispositive. And because he's had this execution stayed, any future execution date can be set on 30 days notice. Mm. Right. And, you know, Jimmy, this, this is one of those things where it's, why, has, why wasn't this done sooner? I right. Mean, we, Timothy Cole, Michael Morton, Anthony Graves, 
potentially Mr. Pruitt here. I mean, DNA tests aren't that hard now. They don't cost that much. And if a man's life hangs in the balance of a simple test, I mean, this, this, he shouldn't have to wait until knocking on death's door before he gets either the final death nail being, hey, your, your DNA's on it, we can't stop, we can't change that, or, dude, it wasn't there, we're sorry. Right, uh, and that's one of the many things we're gonna talk about tonight with Catherine Case. She is the executive director of Texas Defender Services. It's a group that primarily represents indigent uh, individuals, indigent defendants on death penalty cases. And Catherine, I, I guess, let's set it first for the audience. How does someone get charged with a death penalty case in Texas? What are the various ways in which someone can be charged? Well, it really helps if you're poor in Texas, <laughs> right. number one. I don't mean to laugh, yeah. but it's unfortunately true. And, it seems that way. And it really helps if you've killed a white victim. The single largest predictor mm -hmm. of whether you will face the death penalty in Texas is whether your victim is white. And in fact, you're five times more likely if your victim is white versus any other race, correct? Correct. And um, beyond that, it helps. So in addition to being poor and having killed a white victim, it also helps you if you're African American or Mexican American because those groups are overrepresented um, in, on death row relative to their presence in, in the population, the general population in Texas. Um, so, uh, you know, death penalty crimes in Texas all involve murder, but it's usually murder plus. Murder pl in the commission of designated felonies like robbery or rape or an attempted robbery or an attempted rape or an attempted burglary or um, murder involving the status of a victim. So murder of a law enforcement officer, murder of a correctional officer, murder of a child 10 years of age or younger. Um, and or multiple murder also qualifies as a possible death penalty offense. But what's interesting about Texas is we have about 300 cases a year that in which capital murder is charged, yet less than 15 cases a year go to trial. So the big challenge is figuring out how you get from 300 charged cases down to 15 defendants who are only facing the death penalty. All right. And I think the important thing to recognize, too, is that you talked about the statistics with regard to minorities being the overwhelming majority of people who are charged in these cases. It, it should be pointed out. The district attorneys, they have the discretion of, of when to charge someone with a death penalty case and seek the death penalty or not to seek the death penalty, don't they? That's true. In fact, the death penalty is only used, has been used, by about 120 counties in Texas. We have 254 counties, and the biggest users of the death penalty are urban counties because they have the money to pursue the death penalty, not only to put somebody on death row, but then to engage in the defense of further appeals to keep them there. And if you're in, an ur if you're in a rural county, you've, you've probably got lots of agricultural exemptions, um, it's more important for your county commissioners to have a road grader than it is to have a guy on death row, particularly when we have life without parole, mm -hmm. which effectively keeps people in prison for the rest of their lives. And if we make a mistake, we don't have to worry about resurrecting them after we've killed them. Right. And Catherine, you actually made a good point. What is the cost of a, a trial from, from death, penalty, uh, death penalty trial from start to death penalty to you have now been executed versus uh, life without parole? We don't have an accurate number because we don't break out in Texas. The, the prosecution costs, the police costs, the judicial costs, and the, the incarceration costs, all of these extra special costs on the law enforcement side, we don't break out at all. We know from a study by the Dallas Morning News back in the 1990s, they said it was about $2.4 million, and I think that in today's dollars, that might raise it up um, into, you know, more than $3 million, almost $4 million. But we know it's probably quadruple that at the very least because we have so many more costs that, that accrue to the system and that we have no effective way of breaking out. We would really need, um, you know, a specialist in criminal justice who could do a regression analysis to really get us a firm number. But suffice it to say, it's a heck of a lot more expensive than locking people up for life. Right, right. And less costly if you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Catherine, I want to talk about Harris County, not just because this show is put on by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association and because we are in Harris County, right. but because 
Harris County actually leads the nation, it, not just the state, the nation in putting people on death row. This is true. We're the, we're the uh, um, single largest user of the death penalty behind Texas. So we, we are, you know, number two beyond many states. Right, and I think we had a graphic, uh, we have a graphic to put up of, of the number of executions by state, and Texas far leads uh, the rest of the country, I think, since from 1976 to about, to, till 2010, I think our graphic is, uh, shows that Texas has, and here it is up right now, we yeah. have about uh, Texas, and usually, I will say, come the second week in October, I usually want Texas to be this far ahead of Oklahoma, because I am a UT alum, but this is not a, a situation where I'm real prideful to see this. We've got, uh, you know, over the course of about 40 years here, Texas is almost five to one ahead of, of the person in second place, as that is Oklahoma. Where, where do you have any uh, idea where Harris County itself would fall on that? You know, I don't have the latest numbers for Harris County, um, but, you know, we are, uh, you know, we've carried out at least a quarter, uh, well, at least a quarter of all Texas executions have been cases from Harris County. So um, we, we use it the most. And in fact, if we had any question about that, the prosecutors at the Harris County District Attorney's Office, they teach other prosecutors around the state and around the country how to handle death penalty cases. Um, at, but what's interesting also about Texas is, even though we lead the nation in executions and in new death sentence and in new death sentences, those numbers have been dropping, and they've been dropping over the past decade. So, um, you know, executions, not so much. We still tend to lead the nation there, but new death sentences have dropped from a high of 39 in 1999 to 11 last year. Wow. Good. So, speaking of Harris County, Houston and Harris County is a very racially uh, mixed city. It's not like it's largely white and largely black. It's pretty even. What do you think drives the fact that Harris County has the largest death penalty cases uh, in, in, the, in the nation? I mean, I think it's, it has something to do with the history of Harris County, the racial history, which is not well known. And it also has to do with the lack of integration in the criminal justice system until fairly recently. Um, what most people don't know is that during the Civil War, slave owners sent their slaves to Texas and specifically to Harris County and Fort Bend County and Brazoria County because they wanted to protect their property because they didn't believe the Civil War would get this far. What happened was when emancipation occurred, Texas became very concerned about the great numbers of African Americans that we're now free among them. That's when our walled prison system began. Up till that time, you checked in in the morning and worked for the man on his farm, mm -hmm. and you went home at night. After um, emancipation, we created a prison system that locked people up, and it should not surprise you that the majority of people in that prison system were African American. Right. So our, and the Court of Criminal Appeals was established in the Reconstruction era. So, you know, we have this justice system that is arising really in response to the free African Americans we have. And this is a justice system that is very, very white. Um, you know, Houston had Jim Crow just like to... anywhere else. We were the last, HISD was, was fought se desegregation longer than any other school system in the state. There are people in this town who remember um, going to all white or all black schools and being bused across town. Um, and despite living next door, you know, in racially mixed neighborhoods. And, and so, you know, the idea of this racially mixed justice system and, you know, having African-American police chiefs, which is a wonderful thing, having judges who look like the people they're judging, is a fairly recent phenomenon. And not to give uh, any credence to uh, uh, Chief McKellen, but he's African-American, but he was the, or probably the guy who put those people out there in third ward. So, I mean, I don't think just having an African-American police chief is gonna, is, helps it out. I think in, your theory is correct, but I'm just not a big fan of HPD police chief, so. Well, I mean, the other thing is, though, that, I mean, we had Lee Brown, right. you know, before, and, I mean, I, I am glad that he's staying in politics and he's there to talk about his experiences and bring perspective. So I think, you know, 
presence is important because it allows you to have discussions. For example, the presence of Belinda Hill in the district attorney's office is important because it allows you to have discussions that are a lot harder if all of us in the room are white, sure. I think. Or a lot easier, depending on your agenda. Yeah. yeah. We've got our first phone call tonight, a little before the 8.30 hour, but um, we'll get to our lines. Hello, thank you for calling HCCLA Reasonable Doubt. Well, thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I have a unique perspective on executions. I am Ray Hill. I'm the host of uh, uh, Execution mm. Watch on KPFT. Hi, Ray. Thanks hey, for joining hey. us. Thanks for being on the show. And, well, Business has been good, and, and, and this has given me a little different perspective uh, than anyone other than lawyers who actually defend and prosecute these guys and gals, but I get to actually interview them. And in interviewing them, I get, um, I get uh, insight into who they are, and a lot of them are pretty damaged people. We're spending an awful lot of money killing people that Otherwise, yeah. we wouldn't have spent any money on uh, on maintaining, and uh, there are case after case where people absolutely uh, uh, didn't do it. I remember uh, uh, Attorney no. General uh, uh, some time ago having to go to George Bush and convince him that somebody they were about to kill couldn't have done it, and but they're willing to accept their execution because they've been nobody all of their lives. This is an extremely expensive process in terms of emotions and the cost of the state. And I think that we need to pay a lot more attention of getting it right. We no doubt agree with that Absolutely. statement for sure, Ray. And we, we appreciate your call and we appreciate your comments on our show tonight. And uh, we, we encourage everybody to call in. Uh, we'll flash the number up at the bottom of the screen. Also, send us your questions on Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV. Phone line's at the bottom of the screen right now, 713-807-1794. You can call in. We'll put you live on the air here with Catherine Case and answer your questions. Catherine, one of the things that Ray brought up that I think is uh, he talks about the, the number of people that we've, we've gotten it wrong on. And it's no surprise that given the statistics we saw earlier with 518 people put to death uh, in the last 40, 40 years, Texas leads the nation in exonerations as well. And they just keep coming out of the woodwork. Damon alluded to it earlier in our, in our intro. Uh, I mean, how many more are we going to have? You know, it's a good question, and part of the problem is is that we really don't know how many people on death row are innocent. We know we've had 12 people exonerated off the row. We know there are others, such as Carrie Max Cook, um, who was represented by, you know, two local attorneys from Houston, um, and who, w who took a plea deal, you know, pleaded NOLO to get off the row, um, but who very likely is innocent, and uh, the DA's office, in his case, has refused to do any DNA testing, um, doesn't want to know that he's innocent. Right. So, and we know that Carlos De Luna and Ruben Cantu very likely were innocent, as was Cameron Todd Willingham, who I've um, worked with the Innocence Project to get a posthumous commutation for. Um, and then there's Claude Jones, who was convicted largely on the fact that there was a hair at the cash register stand um, that they said proved that he had killed the clerk during a robbery. Um, hair comparison done by a uh, Texas technician said he had, Mr. Jones had killed the clerk and, of course, he had committed other ro armed robberies. Um, except when they did DNA testing after his execution on the hair, it showed that it was the clerk's hair, it wasn't Mr. Jones's hair. So um, it's just hard to know. What do you think? And then also, yeah. For the exoneration, it's one of the things you've mentioned before, or at least on your website, is that these uh, people who get exonerated are almost lucked into it. You have uh, Rayleigh or, or the Texas Innocence Project or a case where you have clear DNA evidence to prove somebody wrong. So what, for those people lucky enough to have that, I mean, what do you think uh, their chances of getting out or how are they impacted by that? Well, I think that, first of all, you're right. Their DNA is... is <laughs> the best thing you can have if you've got it. Unfortunately, only about 10% of the cases have testable DNA. Um, so if you've got a case that depends on some other form of innocence, such as Rigoberto Avila, for whom the forensic 
uh, determination of how the child in his care died looks to be really, really bad, like it was not in accord with the science. Um, if you're depending on other things like the law coming to its senses about bad forensic science, that's highly dependent on the quality of your attorney and the resources he or she mm -hmm. has. Because the courts fight very hard not to provide resources to prove innocence once somebody is on death row because they believe in this idea of finality. Your conviction has been, uh, you know, determined by a jury, a court has affirmed it on direct appeal, and so therefore, good luck. <laughs> um, so, so you have to have attorneys who are willing to fight hard and who are willing to go to experts and say, would you testify for free? Right, yeah, right. Well, and, given this current, current climate, I mean, we've had exoneration after exoneration, We've got all this in the breeze, and yet we still have a number of people awaiting capital cases in Harris County, a number of them, mm -hmm. sitting in the Harris County Jail, uh, higher numbers than anywhere else across the state. Should there be a moratorium on death penalty cases while we get these other cases sorted out? Well, I think that if the district attorney's office doesn't consider a moratorium, it may find one imposed by the voters. Today, Stephen Kleinberg, who is known for running the longest continuous survey of, Har of an urban area in the country, so this is Harris County, the Harris County urban area, found that support for the death penalty has dropped to its lowest level in Harris County in his period of time of doing the, these surveys, and that basically only 26 percent of, of respondents are willing to support the death penalty as a penalty when you've got life without parole on the table. And, in, in, and he says that it's because of these issues of innocence and further the coverage of unfairness because he says, you know what, to support the death penalty you have to believe that the system is fair across the board and the thing that we know is that it's not fair. Right. I mean, and based on that, I mean, do you actually think it would ever be abolished or ended in Texas? I have often said that um, Texas will probably be the last state to abolish, and, um, and I think that we're very tethered to the death penalty. When capital cases go to trial in Texas, defendants have an 80 percent chance of receiving the death penalty at trial, and that number has stayed fairly constant. Um, it is casino odds. Um, so I think we're tethered to it, but as other states back away, I actually think that the likelihood of judicial abolition by the Supreme Court grows greater every day. And I think that the arguments yesterday in the Supreme Court in the Glossop case shows that this court is seeing that abolition is on the horizon. There are just too many problems with the death penalty. We don't get it right. We don't do it fairly. And when we want to kill somebody, we can't even guarantee we're doing it humanely. Right. That leads us to the next area. I mean, I, I'd like to explore, and that is the the inhumaneness of these executions right. that we've seen. I mean, we've seen people gagging, uh, mm -hmm. resisting, uh, and having fighting, spasms, having convulsions. Waking up. Yeah, waking up, and and the the drugs don't even finish the job. For God's well, sake. well, part of the problem is, is that the drugs we use for execution were not created to kill people. All right, so yeah. so midazolam or pentobarbital were not created to kill people. They were created to have a therapeutic effect to put people under anesthesia. They were not created so that we could go put them in a prisoner's vein and snuff the life out of them. And the other issue there is, is that you know you can't experiment on people like that, um, except that's effectively what we're doing and we're torturing people in the process. Um, and I realize there are probably people who are watching who say, well, who cares, these are murderers. Um, and so I just want to take people back. Well, this isn't Game to, of Thrones. To, no, well, let, let's take, well, 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 I want to take people back because, you it's know, in the, <laughs> in the period, um, let's go back to the Reformation, you know, um, when uh, Henry VIII was, was executing people. What's interesting about that was the methods of execution were chosen to reconcile people with their God based on the sin that they had committed that led to execution. So some people were burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. Other sinners, depending on their sin, were disemboweled. Others had their heads chopped off. I mean, there were a variety of ways to kill people. Today, our executions are not done to get people right with God. The purpose is vengeance. 
Right. And then on top of it, the method that we're choosing to use is so that we can accord with the Eighth Amendment's requirement of not having unconscionable suffering. But what we're really concerned about is sort of cleaning it up so that those of us who are looking on it don't have to feel bad watching this person writhe in pain. I mean, you know, there's no nice way to snuff the life out of somebody. Well, and I want to stop you there. You said yeah. that the basis of it is revenge, but the, the other side of that is the people are going to say, no, this is a deterrence, that, that we need the death penalty to deter people from future crime and from future violent crime. What's your response to that? The only people that the death penalty could possibly deter are the people against whom we carry it out. Study after study shows there's no deterrent effect. If somebody com thinks about the crimes, punish about the punishment for a crime, they don't commit it. And, and in fact, as Ray Hill said, the people on death row, these are individuals who have led terrible lives. They've grown up in some of the worst circumstances or they have severe mental illness. Forethought is generally not present and we can contain them by holding them in prison for life and we can protect others from them. One of our one of our people on Twitter asked, um, "Is there be now that we have life without parole for capital cases? Is it realistic that someone would ever pose a future danger to society?" I think the answer would be no. the The Texas prison system is very effective at locking people up and protecting them from harming others, um, and it uses, uh, you know, actually uses solitary confinement quite liberally against people who are believed to be a threat. And in a lot and of cases, they say solitary confinement these days is being overused. I mean, there's, there's a lot of articles yeah, out Michael there Morgan about that. Say that. Certainly, Great. certainly. But the point is, is that the Texas prison system will put people in solitary um, if it believes they're a danger to correctional officers, correctional employees, or other prisoners, and, and uses it quite a lot. So, um, in fact, the rate of offending, of violent offending in the Texas prison system is lower than it is in Houston. And, and Catherine, <laughs> you know? and Catherine that, I think that's important because in a capital death trial, one of the questions the jury has to answer for death penalty is this person will be dangerous to society, including prisoners, right? Right. So given that statement, how do you think that it can still fly in Texas that the actual recidivism rate and, and, and the use of solitary, solitary confinement actually decreases crime in the prison system? At one time, the Court of Criminal Appeals actually reviewed death sentences for whether there was uh, enough evidence, sufficient evidence for, for a determination of future dangerousness. Um, and it overturned death sentences, saying, no, we don't have enough evidence here. That has largely gone by the wayside. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. The court has now changed. It um, appears to have more moderates on it. And I will be very interested to see whether it starts to review these determinations of future dangerousness, particularly in cases, for example, against children, because there are no children in prison. Right. Um, you know, against selected victims who just aren't present in, this, in the prison system or those circumstances aren't present. So, Damon, it's an interesting question, and, and I don't know where we're going to go from here. Certainly the issue deserves much more judicial scrutiny than it currently receives. Right. And you talk about the judicial scrutiny, and one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is Justice Scalia, uh, because, God help him, um, what, recently he said that there is, the, that someone who is legally innocent, if we put them to death, it's not a violation of their constitutional rights. As long as they had a fair trial. Right. I, I, I am trying to, you know, I, look, I, I work with a lot of family members of people on death row. I'm trying to think how that conversation goes with my client's mother, mm -hmm. where I say, we know your son is innocent, the court says he's innocent, but it's okay because Justice Scalia says as long as he had a fair trial, Texas can kill him. I mean... I, I don't know how you have that conversation. I, I have a hard time making sense of it myself as a lawyer. 
I think this is part of the general public's dissatisfaction with the legal system in the way that it handles the capital justice Well, and I think also process. the fact that you've got nine people who sit in a bubble in Washington and they really, they don't see the look on family members' faces that we see. They don't, they don't deal with what, I mean, I think only they, two of them have even dealt with a criminal case. I was say, and they probably never tried a, a criminal case in their right. life. So they have no idea of dealing with the defense side of it at all. Uh, and, and Catherine, along those lines we're talking about, how, how do you explain or how do you talk to someone or what's your opinion on the fact that you can be mentally ill and in, and in life, we know you're mentally ill. You can tell, and yet still somehow found legally competent to stand trial. H how do the courts make that split? Well, you know, I represent Scott Lewis Panetti, right. who was sentenced to death after he was allowed to represent himself at trial wearing a cowboy outfit. And this was while he was on Social Security disability because he had paranoid schizophrenia. <clears throat> schizophrenia. He was so disabled by schizophrenia, the federal government was paying him benefits. He had had schizophrenia by the time he went to trial, I think 14 years, multiple hospitalizations. Um, and he was found competent, a jury actually hung on that, and then he was found competent by a judge, and then found competent to represent himself. And to this day, the media call me and say, how could he represent himself? And particularly when he showed up in court wearing that cowboy outfit, looking like some Tom Mix character, like how did that go on? Mm -hmm. and, and I can't explain that. I mean, that was a trial that occurred in the 1990s. You know, it's like the modern era. Right, <laughs> this right. is not the dark ages. Right. And, and I think what happens is that jurors are afraid of people with mental illness. And because in the criminal justice system, we don't we cannot tell people what happens to defendants if they're found not guilty by reason of insanity or what happens to people if they're found incompetent to stand trial. Jurors are afraid that these people who have committed a violent act will then be free to move about society. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be further from the truth. Right. Nothing. So, so the idea that you're legally comp competent to stand trial, it's really just kind of legal fiction? Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and, and still going on that same vein, with with the with Panetti case and with other cases like that, when how do you deal with that? When you're at trial and you're just trying to prove your client is not there, you know, for whatever reason, how do you how do you as a lawyer do you deal with that issue and, and try to show to the judge and jury and everybody they're not competent? You know, one of the the best things that a lawyer can do is I think not just bring in the medical records, but show the parts of them where the person has a diagnosis, show the timeline, that because the state is always saying, oh, this person is faking or they're exaggerating. But the other thing I think you have to do is show jurors how difficult it is if you're poor to get treatment and medications if you're mentally ill. Because what most people don't know is that if you're poor and mentally ill, you have to jump through multiple hoops to get medication. And particularly if you have something like schizophrenia, the problem with schizophrenia is, while there are a number of wonderful drugs, it takes time to adjust people, to determine which drugs work best. Now imagine you're out in the world, you're living in public housing, you don't have a car, you don't have a way to the doctor, the doctor is across town, you're having some terrible reaction um, to these drugs, you don't like them, they make you feel fuzzy, they might make you gain weight. And it's not like you or me where we'd get into our car and go to our general practitioner's office. I mean, if this person even goes to the emergency room, they're sitting there for hours and hours and hours because it's not like their arm has been cut off. Right. So for, the, for people who are severely mentally ill, this becomes a problem getting good treatment. And so what happens is they end up in the largest mental hospital in the state, which is the Harris County Jail. Absolutely, yeah. We have another call coming in, so I want to get to our phone lines. Hello, welcome to HCCLA Reasonable Doubt. Thanks for your call. Excellent show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry if I get mixed up. There is an echo on the phone. Uh, do you ever use uh, grand jury packets in these cases? And also, do you have any, I'll hang up on this. Do you uh, have any hope of anyone coming up with the right words to get through to legislatures on these rules of evidence. And thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, well, the grand jury packet question is really an interesting one. Um, within the last 18 months, up in Lubbock, there was um, a double murder, and the Regional Public Defender for Capital Cases, which is a capital public defender, investigated the case and discovered that the defendant was mentally disabled, and he had been bullied by these two men repeatedly, and that they came after him, and he had killed them in self-defense. They actually presented this to the grand jury. It was a capital murder case. I mean, this guy had killed two people. He was really looking at the death penalty if it were indicted. The grand jury came back and no-billed him. Wow. Well, so, in answer to the caller's question, yes. You know, um, in the right case, a good grand jury practice can save lives. That's now, assuming you even get the opportunity to present to the grand jury. This right? is true. Now, the difference is, in Lubbock, the regional public defender for capital cases is appointed upon arrest, mm -hmm. you know, immediately. Um, in other jurisdictions, sometimes these defendants don't get lawyers, appointed counsel, until fairly late in the process. Right. It's not supposed to happen that way, but if you're in a legal backwater, it might. And so you might not have, the lawyer might not have the opportunity to litigate in front of the grand jury. You know, you say legal backwater. I know in Fort Bend, uh, I get appointed in cases and there are people who don't get attorneys or don't know their charges until after they've been indicted. You know, I've had plenty of clients who've called me up and I've got a felony offense. I look it up, well, you were indicted yesterday in a crime that took place two years ago. So it's very easy to see how um, you can miss your opportunity to do a grand jury packet in places like that. And, you know, that's what's critically important is that um, one thing we do at Texas Defender Service is we work um, on indigent defense issues and we are big supporters of the appointment of counsel as soon as that person is arrested. You know, they go to that first arraignment and they're supposed to have counsel. And that's true of everyone in the system. And we really have to advocate for that as, as lawyers, which I know that HCCLA does and which I'm enormously pleased with. But I want to get to the caller's second question, which yeah. is about the legislature. Um, you know, the legislature is a very challenging place to work right now. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's a really good question about the evidentiary issues. I'm not hearing at this time uh, a great deal of openness to changing how we determine future dangerousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if there are any legislators uh, listening, I'm all ears if you want to talk about it. I'm, I've got a car. I can go to Austin and talk to you. Well, I mean, you, just you, know? look at, you look at how long it took us to get the Michael Morton Act passed just to say... Right you're entitled to what you should get right. and put it in, and codify it in a statute. So, so we're, uh, correct me yeah, if I'm but wrong, but we're, we're probably a long way off from getting any meaningful relief from the legislature on death penalty cases, right? But I got to say about the Michael Morton Act, which now I'm just going to humble brag. I helped negotiate um, in the legislature and... Um, but you shouldn't we have just, had to negotiate. Yeah, I know. That's but, the but, point. But, yeah. we, but we just put out a report on the first year of implementation, we and Texas Appleseed, and this is the cool thing about it. Now, there are places where there's trouble, mm -hmm. and we could probably all sit around and name some of them ourselves. But the other thing about it is it's largely working well, and we have offices that are taking this seriously, and yeah. lawyers are getting information, which... This is what it should be because it's so much more expensive. And I say this as somebody who represents people post-conviction. It's so much more expensive to go back in and try to rescue them once they've been convicted. It's so much cheaper to prevent miscarriages of justice on the front end. Absolutely. So are you saying it's easier and better to do it right the first time? Oh, yes, right. yes. I, I always hate to have to say to a judge, how many times do you want to try this case, Your Honor? And if it works. You know, we have two questions on Twitter, and I'm going to combine them because I think they're one and the same, uh, or same route. Uh, so the first one is, is can you waive your right to appeals to, to expedite your death sentence? And that the next question is, uh, I just lost it. Oh, there you go. Is there, ex an, is there a way for an express lane to the death, to the death chair? So basically, can somebody uh, charge with an offense, you know, plead guilty to capital death, get found guilty, and then waive appeals and be executed within a year or so? In Texas, um, I would be very surprised if there would be any court that would allow anyone to plead guilty and get the death penalty. I mean, theoretically, it's possible, but I think that judges are very concerned. They would make that happen before a jury. They would... Um, 
they would want the insulation of jury findings. You cannot waive your first appeal. Um, if you try to, the Court of, Criminal Procedure, Court of Criminal Appeals actually has procedures in place to review um, the trial record. Um, you can waive your post-conviction proceedings. Um, and we see very depressed prisoners doing that. You know, death row is an onerous place to be. It's 22-hour-a-day lockdown. And as Anthony Graves has so eloquently stated, there are men who go crazy there. But, you know, I know there's no TV on death row, but I know that there are families who watch the show. And I would say I think it's very, very important not to waive your appeals and to work with counsel and to really fight, fight, fight against the dying of the light, as Dylan Thomas would say. So I want to encourage people to continue that fight because I do believe that we can achieve a measure of justice and we can't achieve it if we give up. One more thing I want to get your thoughts on, uh, one more topic I want to get your thoughts on, and that is the recent revelation about the FBI's hair samples, a lot of which were used to put individuals to death. Uh, we haven't really talked about the federal side, but the, the federal government, they also have the death penalty. Right. Um, it's been used many times. Uh, I'm not sure that the United States government might be in line with Texas in terms of will they the elimination of, of the death penalty. But I want to get your thoughts on just the egregiousness of what many in the law enforcement field hold out as the gold standard, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And here we found out that over the last 25 years, they've been manufacturing hair sample evidence and convicting people and putting people to death for it. Well, and I just want to say that, you know, part of the problem with what has happened with this hair evidence is, first of all, we have people who basically are looking at hair under magnification and saying, well, that, that looks like it matches this other piece. Um, you know, anybody who's got a number of cats and dogs in their house and a shedding problem knows that sometimes it's pretty hard to tell the difference between your own hair and the fur. Um, you know, unless, of course, you you have, you know, a cat in a very odd color. Um, I mean, I had an orange cat for the longest time, and my husband and I sometimes would be like, whose hair is this? Um, but beyond that, there were judges who were allowing these FBI guys to come in and testify way beyond their area of expertise. And we're not acting as gatekeepers of the scientific evidence. That really disturbs me. But there's been a fair amount of legal scholarship showing that when a prosecutor wants to get in a funky scientific theory, judges allow it. And, but when the defense wants to get in scientific evidence, all of a sudden, all of the protections against that are brought to bear. And, and so it does bother me, but we've known since the Oklahoma City bombing trials, thanks to Frederick Whitehurst, who used to work at the FBI lab, that these guys had been, had been engaging in testimony that was not supported by science. So I'm wondering why it's taken us so long to come to this realization that, well, <laughs> you know, there's a problem here. And Catherine, how many people do you think, at least from Harris County or Texas, were convicted and are death row or have been executed based off junk science or, or fraudulent science? Damon, it is impossible to tell because unless we go in and we re-review all those records, we can't know. And nobody, nobody goes in and looks at that unless those people are still alive. If they're dead... Right, it's over. It's over. And in fact, good luck trying to find those records. A lot of those have since been destroyed. The evidence has been thrown out. Um, this is a system that buries yeah. the innocent. Absolutely. And just sweeps away all the problems. It just lets never happen. So, uh, and I wanted to bring something back, Catherine. We, we talk about these cases, and in my mind, I think, man, that happened years ago. And so, certainly not today will we have wrongful convictions, but is that a true statement, or do you think still today it's possible and still happening? I mean, yes, I think we have two areas that the criminal justice system has not effectively addressed, and the first is eyewitness identification evidence. We need to do much more reform there. Eyewitness identification, we all want to believe what people say they've seen, right. but we know frequently when there's a weapon or they're highly emotionally aroused, and that happens during crime, they're not accurate in remembering. The other area that is really problematic are confessions 
And again, we want to believe that people wouldn't falsely confess. We all say, well, I would never falsely confess. You know, Galileo told the church that the sun revolved around the earth, even though objectively as a scientist, he knew that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And the reason he said that was because he was afraid that the church was going to kill him, that the Inquisition was going to kill him. It took the church 400 years to apologize. I really hope it doesn't take us 400 years to reform eyewitness identification and confession evidence. What, what do you think should be the punishment for prosecutors if they, in these situations where, you know, we've seen what happened to Ken Anderson, but is that enough? I mean, did, did that go far enough? We, we, we've had some previous guests on who have said just the fact that he even got charged is, is monumentous enough. But uh, I don't know, I kind of feel like it's kind of a letdown that, that right. it didn't go far enough. Do you, how do you feel about that? You know, my job is dealing with punishment. So to me, the issue is not what the punishment should be for prosecutorial misconduct. The issue should be that it's investigated by the State Bar of Texas, that it's taken seriously, and that there is a process. I think up until recently, there was not self-knowledge within the bar of how lenient they had become. And, and I'm not even sure it was intentional. I think it just happened. I have now gotten to know some of the people in the disciplinary office of the State Bar, and my sense is there is a renewed sense of purpose and much more seriousness. And now I think it's incumbent on those of us who are practitioners to accord with Texas Disciplinary Rule of Conduct 8.03 and report misconduct when we see it. The bar can't do it all on its own. Sure, but what, going back to my earlier question about the, the counter argument about deterrence, where's the deterrence for the prosecutors? I think there's no deterrence if the bar doesn't investigate. Right. And, and in the past, I think that there's been real concern that they didn't investigate, but I think now there is more, there's more effort to do so. I mean, for example, we know that the bar is going after Charles Sebesta, the prosecutor who wrongfully convicted Anthony Graves, and not only wrongfully convicted him, presented, according to the Fifth Circuit, false and misleading evidence and withheld favorable evidence. Um, now, that's going to be a closed proceeding, so we aren't going to be able to watch it as we did the Ken Anderson prosecution, right. but I think that's important. I know that the bar has looked very closely at District Attorney Healy down in Fort Bend. Again, I think that that's significant because it says it's taking it seriously. I think that's the best thing for prosecutors, is that they know they're not going to get a pass in the disciplinary process, just as the rest of us don't get a pass when someone files a complaint. Right. We only have a few seconds left here, so I, uh, I kind of want to wrap up on that note, and I want to thank you for coming on our show uh, and discussing everything about the death penalty. It's really been enlightening for someone like me who doesn't have a heavy practice in the death penalty and, and, and didn't know a whole lot coming in and my research uh, reading about you and all the cases you've been involved in and this discussion tonight really enlightened me and I hope it did as well for, for the rest of our audience so tonight. Too. So I want to thank you for coming on. Hopefully you'll be on with us again. Um, no, you're always invited. Okay, I'm <laughs> happy are. to come back anytime. You have a standing invitation <laughs> right. until Harris County stops doing it. Exactly. The show. Well, and it may be less and less for all we know. Well, Hopefully. Thank you for coming on, and uh, I want to wrap up our show tonight and thank all of our callers for calling in, all of our followers on Twitter for sending us your questions, and I hope everybody has a good night. For my co-host, Damon Parrish, see you all next week.